So um, today we're going to go through robot trains. Um, the objective is to understand the 3D trick coordinate system that Stanek uses for their robots, um, understand train types and applications, and then um, at the end our labs will be creating a tool frame, creating a user frame, creating, creating a jog frame, and then saving some files that are specific to our um, frame files, okay? And that, that's going to be important too because that keeps the information that you store, okay? So first thing we're going to get into is coordinate system. So to the left here should look somewhat familiar. The old math 2D um, coordinate system, X and Y, right? Um, X over Y up. You look here, you got an X and Y coordinate, right? So as we know, the robots work in a 3D system. So you have the X, the Y, and the Z now. So you're going to have an X, Y, Z coordinate system, okay? So you're going to have three coordinate systems. X, Y, and Z for all of your points. Okay, frames takes it a step further. You have X, Y, and Z here. So this is familiar from the previous slide, right? You have X, Y, and Z, so you have uh, frames work in location and orientation. So locations are expressed in X, Y, and Z, which we're familiar with, we just saw on the slide before. And it's millimeters from the origin. Orientation now deals with degrees of rotation about X, Y, and Z expressed in W, P, and R in our position locations, okay? So if you look here, this is just showing you an example of a location with a rotation about the p-axis, okay? So that'd be about the y-axis. So you have x1000, y500, z500, z w0, p of 45, which means a rotation, and r of zero, okay? So when we get into our points or into our frames, you're gonna have all of this information along with it, okay? So it's gonna be a little bit more than even a normal 3D coordinate system. You're gonna have w, p, and r as well. Any questions around that? W, P, and R are on your minor axis, right? Okay. So frames we're going to review. World frame, we all recall that, right? We jogged around a world frame two weeks ago now due to the holiday. Um, tool frame, we might have talked about it or accidentally stumbled upon it in our teach pendant. But a tool frame um, is a user-defined frame offset from the faceplate. Okay, and we'll learn more about that in a little bit. Then we're going to get into a user frame. It's also a user-defined frame. Uh, basically, it's a work, work location, okay? And then a jog frame is also a user-defined frame. So basically, your one default robot frame is world frame, right? Everything else in common here is user frame. So we can teach it. User means teachable, right? You can teach world frame, okay? And we're gonna get into all of them here in a second. So world frame, this is just a little refresher, right? Default frame of the robot cannot be changed. Um, basis for all top positions, and that even means when you set up a user frame, it still references back to world. You just don't see that. The robot takes care of that for you, okay? The origin of the center line of J1 and J2 center line height, see picture. So over here, when we're talking about world frame, this is your origin, okay? Everything's based off the origin of the robot. This location does not change. If it does change, it's because there was a mastering process that happened that wasn't perfect, okay? So this should stay consistent. World frame should always stay consistent unless there's an improper mastering that happens, okay? And when you actively move in world frame, it moves linear, linearly, right? It moves in a line versus joint moves in an arc, right? Remember that? Okay? Um, you'll hear me use TCP moving forward. 
um, as a tool center point, okay? Um, a schedule of 10 loop trippy TCPs are available, okay? So that's typical for um, a tool center point. You'll be able to set up 10 individual tool center points. Can vary based on controller, so you can have more or less based on the controller you have. Or I would assume that there's a variable you can open and get additional TCPs if needed. Active TCP becomes a focal point when jogging. So basically when you set up these TCPs, it's important to remember which one you have set as active because that's the one that's going to be controlling all of your robot movements. So depending if you have a robot with multiple tools, you may have multiple TCPs that you're using for each, each movement or frame. Would that also relate to like the DTS wall then? It knows it goes out to the where it knows the tool is. The DTS. The um, safety. Yes. Safety circuit. Yeah. Um, those are, those that schedule is typically different. You're going to okay. have your your tool and your DTS are going to be different. Um, the tool frame, the tool frame is specific to the tool you're using and the rotation of open. Um, DTS <coughs> is where the robot can go safely within the work. I didn't know if it added in whatever length you put in for the tool. I don't believe so. I don't think so. It, it may. We can look into that. Okay. Um, so that's the default tool center points, okay? Any questions around that? Defining a tool frame. So there's multiple ways you can go about the defining a tool frame. Um, two point plus Z. I've actually never done this. Uh, this is a tool center point for a four axis robot. Um, we will not be utilizing this in this class. All of ours are fixed axis machines. Um, a three-point or three-point option here um, defines the location of the tool. A four-point op option defines the precise location of the tool, but also gives you feedback to tell you how close you are. There's, a, there's an error fit. Okay. So if you look down here um, in this screenshot here, so this is showing you once you. Um, recorded all of your points, all four in this case, there's an additional one here, it's going to give you an error number, okay, and that's going to give you reference of if you're um, close to what you think it should be or not. Your error, your error fit number should come down as you get closer to being an exact tool center point. That'll make a bit more sense when we learn how to actually teach a tool center point because it's basically taking into account how close you are to that point. In, a, in an exact known location every time you rotate it about that point. Okay? You have two different options of six point. You have the XZ and the XY option, and all that's telling, telling the robot is which direction you want X positive and Y positive. In this case, an X positive and Z positive to be. Um, this is important to note, especially the Z. If Z positive is going to be down into the part, be aware of that. Or if it's going to be positive, if you if you pick something that's like a best practice for what you're when you're programming, keep it that way because if somebody grabs a hold of your your robot and has it in the tool and expects the Z positive to be away from the tool and it goes in, it could be a big mistake, right? It could be an expensive mistake. Okay, and then there's also direct entry. So what this means is there's a drawing or a model for your end of arm tooling. You directly import that center point from wherever the known position from your faceplate. And that's your tool center point. The reason why I say it's the most accurate, it's to a drawing. So you're not, there's no room for error. In these other options, you're teaching at that point. So there's room, even though it tells you what the error is, there's still going to be margin for error. Okay? Any questions around these? Super helpful if you can get with your engineering department or whoever's creating your underarm tooling and get a print if you can to figure out exactly where your tool center point is. If not, these other options are completely viable, but if you have that opportunity, I would encourage it. Okay, so here's a pictorial representation of a tool center point, right? So here, uh, default tool center point, right? Center point of the faceplate. So we go into this three point method where we teach it a tool center point, we come to this orientation where now our center point's actually out here, okay? So basically it takes a distance, and in this case it's just in the Z of orientation, right? It's just straight out in Z and tells you what that new tool center point is. So now you're gonna rotate about this point rather than about this point. Okay, make sense? Okay. Um, this isn't necessarily as critical when it's just in a Z, but when you have an offset tool that's not only in Z, but it might be offset in the X and Y, that's when it really comes in handy to have a 
school center plan. So yeah. Seth, are yours directly in the Z or no? Are your tools directly in the Z or are they um, offset? They got ours all first screwed up. We actually don't they hook it up. We don't have any using a tool offset right now. Okay. Which has made for some a couple of crashes so far. Sure. Our, our tool is actually four hundred and sixty five millimeters long. Oh wow. So wow. without that in there it's it's that yeah. hurts a lot and when I'm uh, trying to do use a uh, WP and to rotate around that on teaching it, it doesn't yeah, you're yeah, you're rotating here rather than four hundred and exactly. however millimeters you set it is out. Yeah. yeah that can be a that can be a problem. That's why I'm curious to go through this and see if I can hopefully fix some of this stuff. Sure. Okay, cool. Here's just uh, an option for different tool center points you see here. This is a fan pattern for a spraying operation, basically an application of um, some sort of a either a paint or a, a, a coating of some sort. Here's a torch or a welding arm, right, offset. Here's a gripper and here's another form of a gripper, okay? So this is just showing you the different options you can have for a tool center point. Um, and really the options are limitless. It's about how you teach it or if you can get um, the models you're drawing from, okay? Okay, now we're gonna get into teaching a tool frame here. So this is actually a, um, a recording from RoboGuide. Um, this is me teaching a tool center point um, to this robot. So if you watch here, utilities, you're going to go to setup, then you're going to go over to frames. Okay. In here I'm showing that number, the tool frame is what we're looking at. You have options for different types of frames. Tool frame is what we're working on. So we select tool frame and we're going to use tool frame one. Okay, you hit enter. Now we're going to put a comment in, we're going to name it. I would highly suggest naming all of your tool frames. Okay, in this case I just use the keyboard. Okay, now we have a name for it. Okay? Come down here, go to your first approach point, okay? First approach point is typically in the vertical orientation. The more accurate you are in this, the more accurate your program will be, right? The more accurate, the more the more you can rely on rotating about your tool center point, okay? So I apologize, probably a little bit of in and out zooming and rotating here, but um, the initial point I just recorded as, as a vertical position. Now I'm gonna come back here and I'm gonna rotate about my x-axis, okay? So if you watch, I, I zoomed out of the cell It's only at 5%, I'll speed it up here in a second. You can see it's rotating about the tool center point, right? So you want to get a, a pretty good um, angle on that second approach location, okay? The book references. Um, 90 degrees or better. Um, I'm not quite to 90 degrees, but um, it's relatively close there. And now again, you can see, even though I rotated about my default tool center point, it didn't come perfectly to the point, right? Because there's a distance offset. Okay, so now I'm accounting for that and coming back in to teach my tool center point. So again, trying to line it up as best I can. Uh, go to approach point two, shift record. And now the second point to record. Okay, and here I cheated just a little bit. Basically, I went back to approach point one and said move to. So any one of these points, you can uh, select this move to option here, and it'll move to that point at any time. Okay, it's kind of like a position register. It's a remember point. Okay, now I'm going to rotate about um, the y-axis to get another uh, approach point. And you'll see again, it's not going to come perfectly lined up. And then watch what happens when I hit the record button on this last point. Watch what happens on my teach pendant as well.
Okay, so it looks pretty close. I'm going to go to 4.3, hit record, and now I'll populate it. My two center point offset, okay? So that's important to note here, and, and kind of where I went into the whole error option, right? You can see that that thing is directly in a Z, right? But because I'm not perfect at setting that up, you can see here I'm 0.6 millimeters off in the X and 1.5 millimeters off in the Y, right? Relatively close, all things considered, right? But it's still not perfect, right? It should be something like 100 and probably supposed to be something like 170 degrees directionally in Z only, okay? So just for a frame of reference, it's not exactly perfect doing this, but it's going to get you very, very close. Um, and the closer you make it, the better off you'll be in the long run. Okay, now I'm going to show you the advantage of having a tool center point, okay? So now, I didn't realize this thing would kick off right away, but now we're going to go in, set up again into frames. Okay, this is just showing you um, my tool frame. Okay. I'm activating tool one, tool frame one. Oops, it went through the same one. Okay, that's why I did that. Okay, I want to go back to the start. Yeah, this is the one I like. So moving about in a tool frame, this one's going to show you we're going to come back, show you the frame. And the reason you know it's my frame is because I'm not perfect in the X, Y, or Z. Okay, so this is the one I actually taught. And now this is going to show you the advantage of having this. Okay, we're going to we're going to activate this tool center or this um, tool frame. So right here it's telling you what tool frame I'm in. I'm in one. Okay, so that's the one we just taught. And you're not going to notice it necessarily in the X and the Y. But watch when I rotate and start moving in the Z direction. Watch what it does. Now I'm going to start moving in Z. It follows the tool center point, right? If I was in world, it would just go up and down, right? Exactly vertical. Now it's following whatever angle that tool is at. Okay, you see that? That's super helpful when you're programming robots. I don't know if I shared this with you guys, but I spent probably the first three years of my career programming robots not knowing this. Or about user frames either. So it was super helpful for me. Um, took programming down from days to hours, basically. Okay? You guys understand that? Or you want me to go through that again? Does that make sense? How that actually works? Yeah, so that, that's the same point that you're at. I think right now I'm on par to uh, two or three years of knowing this. That's, right. that's where we're at right now. And, uh, fast forward. Super helpful, Mark. Make sense to you? Just go through one more time. Sure, yep. Okay, so now I'm just making sure it's active. So there's nothing, I mean, this is just making sure I have the right tool frame. So shift coordinate, we learned that before, right? To change our coordinates. Um, here's the tool frame that I had. We know that because it's not perfect. I'm just making sure I have that one active because if you don't, it's not going to move in that direction. So now I just show you in the in the regular X and Y orientation, it's not a big difference unless you truly have an offset position. But now when you start rotating about the tool center point and moving Z, normally it moves straight up and down, right? The world or an arc. Now it's following exactly where your tool center point is. Okay, so let's say, let's say you want to move in, right? See that? Okay. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice it a lot more when you actually, so we'll do that out in the, in the lab. You'll move up, you'll move Z positive and Z negative in world, and then do that in tool, and you'll see a significant difference. And it's, I know it's a little bit difficult with it being a robot guy, but when you actually hands are on it, you'll definitely notice a difference. So I can, I mean, I could potentially do this this won't affect any existing programs the way the one runs. Uh, if it calls a tool center point out, make sure you teach a different one. I think, I think the only thing, I mean, it calls out the tool, whatever tool, but I think 
the UD calls over the user frame. Yep, user frame would be the actual work program. The yep. tool frame, does it call a U tool and a U frame? It calls out a U tool and a U frame, but there's nothing in the, I guess it's the fake place. It's sure, but, set it, you know. but that's what all those points reference now. So it will cause yeah. an issue if right. you automatically plug something in there. That's the conversation I've had with my, my boss currently. Uh, was saying that, oh, we'll just add that in later. He wants to just count out all these programs. And I'm like, I, I feel like that might not work. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is an option, like when you copy it, ask if you want to use your default TCP or something that there's a question there. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how that would work doing a whole program moving from one to the other. Um, but typically what happens is the tool center point that you're in and is active is the one you're teaching all those points in. So all of your rotations right now in your program are rotating about this point. Yeah. So if you all of a sudden add this tool center point in there, the distance, that D is going to be significantly different. And it's not going to ask you that. It's going to think you know what you're doing when you type that into your into your um, tool center point. Yeah. And it's just going to go there. Yeah. Or not, because it might be out of your work envelope, because you're talking 400 millimeters. Yeah, that's why I've had a couple of crashes with some duct work and stuff, because it just goes Yeah, down. it might be completely out of your work envelope. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to add that, I would highly recommend teaching you a different tool center point, like 10 or something, or 9. Do a different program and start rotating. I mean, you can copy it, but you're going to want to use that new tool center point to reach yeah, your point. True. I've done the copy and paste into a new user frame. Yep, you so can do that into a tool frame too. New tool frame. But I would make sure you have your copy that works yeah. and do that off to the side. Stretch your frame. Yep, yeah. yep. Right. Okay, makes sense. Any other questions? Okay, user frames. So user frames can be set up in any location or orientation so long as it's within your work envelope, right? Um, all positions are recorded in the active user frame, so just like a tool frame, so whatever user frame you're in, and you record those points, are gonna be the active user frame, okay? If no user frame is specified, the user world frame is active, okay? So if you don't specify a user frame, it's gonna use user frame zero, which is world, okay? All positions recorded are a reference to the origin of this frame. So we'll get into a little bit more detail about that in the next couple of slides here, okay? So defining a user frame, in this case you have three point, four point, and direct entry. Again, direct entry, if you have that option, I mean, that could be an exact model of yourself. So if you have that, that's great. Typically, not a lot of times with the user frame, in my experience, that I have an actual layout of the, an accurate layout of the, the cell. So recording a three point defines the user frame a frame with an origin position other than a reference position is what would you, you would use in a four point. So basically what that's saying is you're gonna typically set up a tool frame. Um, that'll be, you know, let's say this is X, this is Y. You're gonna be here, and this all your origin is gonna come back to here. But if you have a specific reason why you want a different reference position, you can teach a different reference position your coordinate system. So it doesn't reference this anymore, it's going to reference back to here, okay? And basically that's just allowing you to maybe uh, move that move that position, allowing for a little bit easier programming in some in some instances, okay? So basically here's here's the factory uh, set world frame, right? We know the origins back here, right? So now we're setting out a user frame, and in this case, in this picture, the origin is here. So what this is basically showing you is for me to tell you what exactly this point is, using a world frame, I have no clue. But if I'm over here, I can say it might be 10, 10 in this direction, which might be X positive, and 10 in this direction, which might be Y positive, it's gonna go to that point. If I did that over here, I'm not quite sure where it's gonna go, right? Okay, does that make sense? Kind of like Mark, I think he said absolute versus machine coordinates and CNC, right? Yep. Very applicable here. We just call it a user frame. Okay. Yep. Okay. <coughs> um, and just a few things that I want to put hit on here. When no data is defined, the user frame location is the origin of the world frame. So just to remember that if you don't tell it what frame you want to use, it's going to use 
the last frame that was active in there, and if that's not the case, it's gonna use zero, okay? And the important part there, and I think we talked about this previously, if you teach something in one frame and go to read a program in another frame, it's gonna be a U-frame mismatch, and it's not gonna work, okay? And then you're gonna have to reteach all your points. Um, user frame data is a, is a measurement back to the origin of the robot, so even though we're programming in the user frame, it's actually referencing back to the original positions, right? We just don't see them. Um, there are nine default user frames, um, and again, numbers may vary per controller, but by default, there's typically nine. And um, selecting the user as a jog frame defines how the robot will jog. So when we hit the coordinate button, and we select user, that's gonna define, whatever your active user frame is gonna define how the robot's gonna move. Okay, so whatever your active user frame is, going to define um, how the robot will go. So here we're going to get into teaching a user frame. So again, same steps, menu, setup. And this is step by step in the lab as well, so don't feel like you have to follow along um, or write notes. And you go to frames. And again, you'll have your option here. We're already in the user frame rather than tool frame, so be aware. Otherwise, you choose other, and you can pick tools, jog, user, um, cell frames, which we're not going to cover today. So we're in the user frame. We're going to do one again. Again, make sure you name it. Name it something that makes sense, because you might know today what you're trying to do, but in six months when you come back, you may not know what your user frame was, right? In this case, we're doing the three point, OK? So first we're going to teach the orientation or the orient origin point. So for me, having a machinist background, I teach this to me like how I would do the machining. Okay? Which is exactly the opposite of a robot, so which is how you know it really works, because in a robot, X is going to be away forward and away from the robot, right? Um, now when you teach a user frame, you can see here it's in it's in world frame right now. X is back towards towards and away from the robot, and Y is across the front of it. In my world, my brain works exactly the opposite. So typically when I teach a user frame, I do exactly the opposite of what a robot normal um, world frame is, okay? So now back to the Cartesian coordinate, this is like your x0, y0, right? And again, as accurate as you can be, you want to be, because that'll result in more accurate uh, movements later. A couple things to pay attention to here. I'm going to be doing the shift record option just like I was in the other one. Um, but once I sh once I record the last point, again, watch this, and then also watch um, the triad here. The triad will shift. Okay. So I record the first point. Now, for me, like I said, as a machinist, I'm going to go way over here to teach my X point. And if you notice here, on you can do this on a teach pendant too. Double button. It will move at an angle versus um, going straight across. And you can see how you have to step over, right? Over, up, over, up, over, up. Not real convenient, not real handy for teaching points, right? Again, I'm going to use my pointer, get as accurate as I can. Now I'm going to record my X direction. Shift record, right? And I'm going to come up to this point here, and that's going to be my Y direction. Does it matter which one you do? What's that? So why would you take the other corner? I do it because my origin is in that corner. In that corner, right? Yeah. It really, as long as you go in the Y direction you want it to, it will work. Okay. I just had a habit. Try to make it as big of a line as I can because that's more accurate. The further you can go in your work envelope. And I also try if there's a way to coordinate that with what I'm actually working on, I'll do that as well. So in this case, I have these nice dots that I'm following too, right? So I'm going to go to the dot and uh, I show it all. So now, I mean, not getting too far off topic, I've seen. Unlock it, and you can freely move the robot not fast. close to that point. Not you don't fast. do that. Um, I think the I'm not certain. I haven't played with um, a. Uh, I can't 
particular the name of this. Um, the Kobot, what I've heard, and I think you can actually use it, but I have, I, I have no point of reference. Though. Maybe that was the, we had a demo brought in. Probably Kobot. out of Plymouth or Keel area, and it, it was on a cart, you know, so you can wheel a machine to machine for yokes. Yep. And I think that's how they did that. You, you hit a button and then you could freely move it, and then, okay, that's my, that's where I want it. And believe it or not, there's robots, like that's going back to some of the original robots where they were going to be going through locations like this part. Okay. So if you look here, my triad completely shifted. X is now in the horizontal, Y is in the vertical. And the Z I didn't mess with, but it totally flipped that. Just so because of where you chose your origin. Yep. Yeah, and we're not necessarily where I chose my origin, but where I told the robot which direction was X and which direction was Y. y. So now we're going to forward on to the next, and this is just moving in the user frame, right? This is exactly what I showed you before, but this is going to show you the advantage of the user frame now. So this one you will notice in the X and Y, because if you look at this, you can't see it very well because I didn't do a good job trimming out my robot, but this robot, this face is not directly in front of the robot. It's at an angle to the side of it, okay? So when I select and make this active as my tool frame, or as my user frame, rather, um, just making sure, now it's at zero, so it's in world right now, so I had to press the number one to make it active. And it switched my triad. Now you'll see, when I move my negative, I think I go first, it comes right back to the direction I want it to. Okay, and I'm just gonna follow this line, I'm gonna trace this line so you can see the advantage of this, because like I said, this fixture is not directly lined up with the front of my robot, so it's not exactly world, and even if it was, this should be Y, and right now I'm moving to X. Right, and I'm moving right along that front edge, just following that line exactly. Now I'm gonna move in the Y direction, and it's gonna follow exactly that, that user frame, okay? This is the power of the user frame. It takes it and says, all of my points are referenced off what I just taught it, okay? Does that make sense? This, should, this is probably a little more familiar, Mark, because this is very similar to machine programs, right? Okay, okay make sense? I'm trying to relate it to what I'm doing, but it's a little bit different from us. We talked about that thing going on when we got tools on. Yep, yep, sure. In these frames, you can teach in any orientation. Like, I could have taught it easily in an inclined plane, and they'll do the same thing. Okay. All right, jog frames. We're not going to do the tutorial of a jog frame on, on the screen. Um, but you are going to teach one out in the lab. Uh, a jog frame can be set at any location with any orientation. Again, that has to be within the work envelope, right? Um, dragging the robot can be per performed in a jog frame. So again, you'll hit your coordinate option. And you'll go to jog, and it'll, it'll select the active jog frame, just like we did before. Positional data is not dependent on the jog frame. So this is where it's a little bit different. A jog frame is not necessarily attached to positional data. It's just something that you can use to make it more convenient for you to be moving the robot around. Okay, not necessarily tied to anything um, with the actual location of the part, but it will allow you to jog a little bit easier. Like let's say you want to jog on one, one plane that's not necessarily set up as a user frame, but you want to set up a jog frame that allows you to, to jog on a different surface real easy, you can set up a jog frame and jog on that. Okay? Useful when robot movements are not specific to a defined user frame. So basically kind of what I just said there. If you don't have a defined user frame that you want to be moving around in, you can set up a jog frame that's in independent of those user frames that you can use to jog your robot. And it will follow that exact new thought frame, but it won't reference that in any position. Okay? Defining a user frame, this one's a little bit different. There's only the three point option and then direct entry. Okay. So now we're going to get into saving frame information. Okay, this is the last part of the part of the lecture here. Um, there are two files that make up robot frame data. Framevar.vr and sysframe.sv. So these are two um, files that are created by the robot that hold all the data for your frames, okay? So these are ones that you want to keep somewhat um, recent. So like I have on here, best practice is to save these files when TCPs are updated. So if you change a TCP, 
you're probably going to want to back up these files so that you have them as a new TCP or a new tool that's added to your process. If you put in another TCP, you might want to save these back to your wherever you keep your backups, okay? Because the, the cool part about these files is you can bring them back, import them if you lose your data, and all of your current frames will be next. Okay? So for each TCP, do you have those two files designated to that? No? These two files are bringing every TCP. So when you bring in the data, it's going to bring in a new set of everything. So whatever is currently in there, it I'm could. Just thinking if you have a program where you know you're going to use this end of arm tooling, yep. Your TCP won't really change other than the end of it, right? Yeah, the end of it could be longer or shorter. Yeah. But the problem is, is that your robot doesn't know that it is necessarily right. So like your points are taught position, right? So like, you need to be very careful that you're augmenting your TCPs without at least checking your program to make sure that it didn't affect the rotation of your of your actual program. I, I know what you're getting at, like, hey, let's say I just decide to cut off 10 inches off this tool. No, I'll say, I'll say, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know, I'm stuck. But let's say, you can, can you have one robot with two end of arm tools? Not at one time, typically, but absolutely. That's the whole reason you have a schedule of 10, 10 TCPs because you, a lot of times you'll have quick chain tooling. Right, that's what I'm getting at. Then you'll drop it, it will pick up the other one, and then you'll activate that tool frame. And then that'll be a new frame, a new system frame. Well, just a new tool frame if you're using the same user frame. So oh. typically, typically what I will do at the beginning of any each kind of program, at the beginning of every, any each kind of motion program, Line one, okay, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but what this does is line one will say you tool, and then you tell that robot what you want that tool to be. And then you frame, there's a user frame that you tell that robot you want to be operating in, okay? So then to your point, Mark, you go through all these different points, right? But you never come out of this teach center program. But let's say you go switch tools. Now you have, let's say it's line 100. You tool number two, and up here was number one, right? So let's tell the robot, you now have tool two on there, whatever that tool, and tool TCP is. You need to have taught all those points with that TCP, but yeah, absolutely, you can continue on and use and there's up to, I think, 10 of those. So you can have 10, um, 10 TCPs, and you can do that in your program, okay? okay? But best practice, this is just my, my experience, best practice at the beginning of your, of your program is to do that, because what you can also do when you do that is if you're ever gonna start touching up points, if you read the first two lines in your program, you've already set up your active user frame and your active tool frame, because by reading those lines, it does exactly what the shift coordinate button does by setting it. If you read those two lines, it'll do the same thing and it'll set that as active. And what that also does is if you're moving the robot around in a different user frame or tool frame, and all of a sudden you want to run a program, it'll flake out if you don't have these two things at the beginning of your program. Because you may have been in a different active frame before that. Okay, so this is just my best practice, what I've learned. Always at the beginning of a, a motion program, Throw those two lines in there, and then you'll see it'll, it'll significantly help you in the long run. Okay. And what it also does is allows you to like just do a quick gut check, even even if the tools are already active. <coughs> quick read those first two lines, and then touch up your points, because then at least you know you're not screwing up your program because you had a, a different active frame, and now you now you've literally messed up your program. Remember the on debug, and it only works. 